Hey First Assembly, this is Pastor Wes. I hope you've had a great day and I'm excited to get into the Word of God with you tonight during our Wednesday Word. Hey, it's so good to be with you this evening and I want to thank you for joining and um, as always, I want to take a moment just say, hey, if you're watching on Facebook, if you'd please hit the like button. If you're watching on YouTube, if you would hit the subscribe button, that's a real blessing to us. And, and please make sure you comment. Let us know that you're there. If you have a prayer request, we want to hear about it so we can agree with you in prayer. If you have a testimony, uh, we want to celebrate with you what God is doing. And I want you to know and to trust that God is at work and God is moving uh, today. Uh, we've taken a little bit of time and we have been talking about hardships. Uh, what do we do and how do we live when hardships or trials find our lives? And over the last few weeks, one of the things that I have said, and, and I found that not only have I shared it with you, but I've used this in so many conversations and it just keeps coming back to me as true and it keeps coming back to me as true. And it's just simply this, that pressure and bad angles create injury. Um, when we get in pressure situations and we aren't in alignment with God, it can create pain and struggle uh, in our lives. But when I'm walking with God, when I'm allowing God to shape me, mold me, change me, and I'm walking in alignment with Him, uh, Scripture says that we can remain. And I think there's such power in that, that some of our struggles that we go through and hardships that we face, God is using to teach you something. And it's important for us to remain in it so that he can finish his perfect work uh, in you. Uh, we took a couple of minutes last week and we talked about not allowing bitterness in our hearts because it causes trouble and it defiles uh, many. And I love that the writer of Hebrews, I believe it was chapter 12, identifies it as the root of bitterness. And, and it's such a great definition because roots uh, work their ways deeper into the ground. Roots work their ways into stuff. They grow into things. And the thing is this, the longer that a root is in the ground, the deeper it grows and the harder it is to deal with it. And I think that's true of our lives as well. Uh, the longer I go without dealing with the bitterness in my heart, the more of a challenge it is to get that root out. Because those roots of bitterness, they cloud your judgment. They affect the way that you see things. Uh, it would be like getting up in the morning and, and putting on a dirty pair of glasses. It creates a filter that keeps you from seeing things in the light of truth. And, and truth is so important because it's truth that ultimately sets us free. So we need to see things in truth. And scripture says that it springs up on us. And I love that because it's a dynamic of, of this. You don't always know when it's going to show its head. Um, you can hide it from a lot of people. You can hide bitterness from, from in everybody for a while and some people for a little while, but eventually it's going to find its way to surface and it's going to surface in your actions. It's going to surface in your words. It's going to surface in the way that we treat each other or speak of each other. It always comes to the surface. Nothing stays hidden forever. And, um, and bitterness, Scripture says, can torture you. Uh, and what a unique word. Um, it can be the thing that is the root that causes pain in uh, your life. And because it's a root, and roots aren't seen, but it's the roots that determine the type of fruit that you bear. And so we can get so busy in our lives blaming the fruit of our lives. Uh, we end up blaming all the wrong stuff and, and we wonder why nothing really changes. Uh, you wonder why your relationships end up the same way. You know, every boyfriend, every girlfriend I've had, I've had this struggle in the relationship. Why does it keep ending up uh, the same way? You know, why, why does my, my jobs always end up the same way? You know, I go to a new place and I think, ah, oh, the problem was the old boss or the problem was my old coworker. But you go somewhere new and the same problems show their head again. And, and at some point you kind of have to step back and say, is it a root of something in me? And that's the fruit that I'm bearing in my life because until you really address the roots in your life, uh, nothing is really going to change. Uh, just because you pick all the apples uh, doesn't mean that it's still not an apple tree. Um, the roots determine everything. Uh, and the true thing is that often, even if you pick the apples and, and cut the branches back, everything grows better after being pruned. Uh, positive things. You know, Scripture talks about we're part of the vine and we prune the branches and, and, and a faithful gardener, a loving gardener does that because it helps us to grow and to become. Uh, but that doesn't just work in just positive things. That can even be negative things. You pick the fruit and you break off some branches and I'll never be that again, but we just prime ourselves to grow 
better in the negative if you don't get the right roots inside. Uh, and we spoke about how bitterness leads to profane living. And, uh, you know, I love how they, they kind of used uh, Esau as an example of that. And, and some of the translations said he was sexually immoral. Others says he was a fornicator. Uh, but when we read about the life of Esau, I, I don't think that's the best translation because it doesn't really lay that out as, as his reputation. But what he did have an issue with in his life uh, is when it talks about don't, don't be immoral as a person is that he, he was unfaithful to God. He did not value um, spiritual things uh, they, the way that he should have. They didn't mean anything to him. Uh, and you saw that in Genesis 25 when he comes in from hunting and he hadn't been successful and he was starving and, and, and he was so focused on his immediate need that he was willing to trade his birthright away for a, for a bowl of soup uh, to his brother uh, Jacob. And, and uh, it, it's just an amazing story. It's one of the worst deals that you find in Scripture. And he just did not value spiritual things. And he did not value the things that God valued. And a birthright was a very spiritual thing. Uh, and the blessing came from the father to the oldest son, and they were big deals. But he just did not value them. And uh, you know what? I think if we took a minute and we stopped and thought about it, we all know people who have done this. Maybe even ourselves. Maybe you're watching tonight. And you know what? You have, you have made a deal like Esau. You had something that was of great value that you traded for something that was very temporary. And, and that goes on. Anytime you trade something of great value for something that's so temporary, and the truth is when we don't value the right things, we end up trading them for bowls of soup in our life. Uh, and we always regret it down the, down the road. Uh, it always costs us more than we think uh, that it will. Uh, and it's wild because Esau later in his life wanted to go back and inherit these things, uh, and he couldn't. He just kind of woke up one day and said, man, what have I done? Why did I do that? Why did I give that to Jacob and trade him my birthright and the blessing? Uh, you know, what was I thinking? And he went back to get it back in Hebrews 12, and, and, and it says that he was rejected. Um, and the word rejected there kind of carries with it uh, a connection to the word disqualified. He was disqualified from receiving that thing. And as you dig deeper, it really means just this. Esau really didn't want to repent of what he did. He just wanted to receive what he wanted. Uh, there was no real change of heart. And, and the problem is, uh, in life, sometimes you, you, you just can't uneat soup. Uh, once something is done, it's done. Uh, there are some things that you can only, that you can't undo, but you can only repent of and move forward in. And so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of how we built last week. And, and I'm going to kind of jump on a verse that I keep coming back to because I just think there's so much meat in it. In, in Job 23.10, and he says, But he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as pure gold. Uh, and I love that because it says the time will come that the test that you are in will be over. And he says, when he has tested me, once God has tried uh, me. Uh, when I was a young man uh, growing up, uh, my grandfather lived in the house next to us, probably about, I don't know, eighth of a mile, quarter mile from us. And I can't tell you how many times I'd come home from school and mom would say, hey, I, I told granddad that you would come over and help him you know, uh, you know, do some work. And it was usually really exciting stuff, like pulling nails out of boards. Not very exciting. Uh, but we would go over, we'd work with him. And my grandfather uh, was, a, was an amazing man. I love him, love him. And, uh, but he would always have these little quirky sayings. He'd always have little things he would say. And, uh, and I'll never forget one time I'm over there, and there was two of them that really, as I was writing this, stuck out in my mind and stuck out of my heart. And one of the things he used to say to me all the time was, Son, I'm going to spit in your eye and drown you. I'm going to spit in your eye and drown you. Now, when I was a kid, I had no idea what that meant. I had no clue, um, and, but I just knew I did not want to experience that. It sounded terrifying. Now that I'm a little bit older, I'll be 50 uh, in October, uh, I can tell you that I still don't know what that means, uh, but it does still terrify me. Um, anyone who could spit in someone's eye and drown them, uh, I do not want to make angry. Uh, so that was one of the things he'd always say. The other thing he would say all the time was this. On more than one occasion I heard this, he would say, boy, you're trying my patience. And, uh, you know, I was young. I didn't really get that. As I've gotten older, I get that now. Because what it meant was this. He didn't know how much patience he had, and I was helping him figure that out. Uh, that's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. And I know it was kind of me to help him that way. 
But the thing is this, when we go through trials, it's not for God to figure something out. It's for us to figure something out. God already knows how much we can take. God already knows how far our faith will carry us. God already knows. And so when we're tested by God, it's for you and I to figure out what we have and also what we need to be the person that God intends us uh, to be. And, and that's why you don't run when the pressure's on. That's why we don't quit when times get tough. That's why we stay the course and let God finish His perfect work in you. You see, too often we want relief, but God wants maturity. We want the fastest way out, but God says, stay the course and learn what I'm trying to teach you. And so a lot of times that applies to the trials and the hardships that we face. Uh, but then we find ourselves with a unique scripture like today's in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. And it's Paul, and he says this, Even though I received wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger, uh, or, yeah, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away, and each time he said, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. He said, So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and hardships and persecution and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Uh, thorn there literally translates uh, to mean splinter, a, a piece of wood or metal or something that has gotten under the skin. It's embedded under the skin and it can create pain that is disproportionate to its size. A little splinter can make you very uncomfortable. It's not like drop to your knees pain, but it is a constant aching, a constant pulling, and a constant uh, pain that you're dealing with. And Paul is famous uh, for a lot of things, but one of the things he's famous for is this thorn in his side. And there are a lot of people who have a lot of ideals on what the thorn is and what the thorn was. Uh, I've been told it was headaches, that he suffered from headaches. Um, uh, there were others that have said they thought he had epilepsy. Uh, and that was the thorn that he was dealing with. Um, yet again, others said that there were people who just antagonized him. That while he's trying to teach and write, they were always, always pecking at him. Always just pulling at him. Always poking him. And, uh, and just antagonizing him. Very adversarial of his ministry. Uh, and that was the thorn in his flesh that he had to continue to deal with these people throughout his life. Um, some say it was eyesight based on a, a scripture in Galatians 6.11 where he talks about uh, writing them with large letters because they felt like maybe his eyes weren't very good and so he had to write uh, in big letters. Um, there are others yet that talk about it being a character flaw or, or sexual temptations. Uh, others a sin that just wouldn't leave him alone and, and we don't know. The truth is it never comes out and tells us that this was Paul's a thorn in his flesh. And I, I believe that if God wanted you and I to know that God would have told us. But I think it's, it's best not to know because we can look at the life of Paul and see that he had a thorn. And we can look and say, you know what, sometimes we have thorns. Uh, that there are things in our life that aren't quick and temporary but seem to be uh, a long battle, seem to be a drawn out battle. And that's what a thorn is. A thorn is an enduring trial. You know, there are normal trials that we deal with and they tend to come and go. And we've talked about that. You know, James 1.12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The beginning and the end. There's a hardship, there's a struggle, there's a trial, and then there's a victory in it and God blesses us. Hebrews 12.11, no discipline seems pleasant at the time but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Um, but a thorn is different. A thorn in your flesh is a whole different bird. It's an enduring pain, and you got to follow me, that is allowed by God for our good. And sometimes we can get really hung up on this, and, and I think we need to clarify it a little bit. Because if we let our minds go to the place where, where, where God did this to you, you know, God sent the storm that knocked the tree over and hit your house. God gave you cancer. You know, God caused your spouse to leave. God did this against you. It affects our brain. It affects our mind. It affects our view and understanding of who God is. And it affects the way that we follow after Him. And I think that there's a very big difference difference between being in a situation where God allowed something to happen and God directly 
causing something to happen. And so anytime we hit hardships or things that are very tough, we kind of package them into one of, of four or five areas. And one is this, we ask ourselves this, does, does God have limits? Um, does God have a limit? Can God do anything and everything? Uh, when I was a young man, I can remember hearing people uh, speak and talk and, and they would ask questions like this. If God can do anything, can he make a rock too big for him to pick up? And I can remember as a child thinking, well, that's kind of a stupid question. Um, but again, now that I'm older and a lot more mature, I still think it's kind of a stupid question. You know, why would God do that? I, I, I just think those are things that we call logical contradictions. Uh, and, and they're trying to make a logical army, but it, yet it's a contradiction of itself. And God doesn't contradict himself. Um, God can do anything that needs to be done. Uh, that's who God is. That's what he can do. And he will not act against his nature or his character. Uh, another thing is that the world uh, that God made was good. You know, God made a perfect world. And so what happened? What went wrong? Why do bad things happen when God created a good world? And, and here's the thing. In the midst of that perfection, one of the things that God did is God gave you and I choice. Um, God doesn't want robots serving him. God said, I'm going to develop and grow and create and prepare. And I've, I've given you this, this, this planet, you know, Adam and Eve, you have dominion over it, but you have a choice in serving me. You have a choice in loving me and, and forced love is not real love. And so God gave us free will. And, you know, he doesn't want to make you come to church and worship him. Uh, how, how exciting would that be? I mean, can you imagine for those of you that are, that are married, if your spouse said, oh, it's, it's you know, Sunday at, at 1030, uh, it's time for me to tell you I love you, uh, so I love you. Um, there's no passion in that. There's no excitement. There's no joy in that. It, it doesn't mean as much as having someone who chooses to love you with their heart, soul, and mind. And so God gave us free will. And the thing is this, in order to have meaningful obedience, there had to be the possibility of disobedience. And so God created, not created disobedience, but God gave you free will to make the choice for your life. And so sometimes our hardships come from those things. Uh, third thing is this, we see the effects of sin in the world. Uh, we see the effects of sin in the world. Uh, in the world where people truly have freedom to choose, there are people who choose sin. There are people who choose uh, to, to, to do things contrary to God's will and God's desire. And sin only has three goals, to steal, to kill, uh, and to destroy. That's the whole purpose of it. Uh, and because Adam and Eve sinned and sin entered the world, uh, the world is broken. Uh, it's just a broken place. Genesis 3, 17 and 18, uh, Romans 8, 20. You can read them. You can check it out. It just doesn't work. And we see the effects of sin. Uh, people harm each other. You don't turn on the news. You, you see crazy things. You, you see, uh, I saw on, on, on news the other day that they found, you know, like 37, 38 children that had been trafficked in a trailer aging, ranging in ages from 3 to 17. And I, I just am floored by things like that. And I think what kind of person would do something like that to a child? Listen, people choose to harm each other. People get sick. People die. There are accidents. We, we see the effects of sin everywhere. There's racism in the world. I mean, you, you see the, the tension. There are people who hate other people simply because of the color of their skin. And, and that is the effect of sin in a life. And, and racism is sin. We've talked about that before, but those things are sinful things. And that's why you and I are called to live so differently. We're called to live counterculture and to live our lives in a way that, that uh, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what scripture says. That's what our lives are to represent. That what God's doing in heaven and he desires to be on earth, he's using us to do it. He's using us to accomplish that. And so we're to live counterculture to the world uh, today. The fourth thing was this. We say, oh, God could have prevented it all. God could have prevented it all. He could have stopped it. Uh, but in a world where we all have free choice, and the truth is that when you make a decision, it has a consequence on your life and the lives of those that are around you. And the thing is this, obedience and disobedience both have consequences. Uh, the consequence of obedience is often blessing, uh, breakthrough, victory, strength. The consequence of disobedience is often struggle and pain and loss uh, and hurt. Uh, both have consequences. Now, I believe that God does intervene. 
Uh, and I'll be the first to tell you, I pray for miracles. I pray for miracles for our church. I pray for miracles in your life. I pray for miracles in my own home. And, and I believe that God intervenes. Uh, and when he does, that's what we call them. We call them miracles. But there are times that God will allow things to play out you know, based off of our choice to play out. And he will be there with you. God doesn't leave us. God doesn't abandon us. But sometimes we deal with the consequences of our choices. And sometimes we deal with the realities of sin in the world. And God walks us through it rather than remove us from it. God inserts himself so that he can work it for our good. And Romans 8.28 says that. We know that in all things... See, that's the part we got to get in all things, not just the good stuff and not just the fun stuff, but even in bad things, even in challenging things, even in hardship things that are based in sin that have either been decided by ourselves or others and we're dealing with the effects of that. All things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, all of us go through struggles and trials, and, but we do not all face them the same. Uh, it's different when you are with Christ. And, and we all have that we can celebrate uh, tonight. And whether it was something that happened because the world is broken or if it was a, dis a decision of ours and disobedience and we're dealing with the consequences of that, we face it differently um, with Jesus. And so I've said this before, but I'm telling you, now is the time to be right with God. Now's the time to be right with God. And so there is a danger, though, I will say this, of, of making God casually responsible or related to the things that happen in the world because of sin. We, we blame God for everything. And uh, I, I read this earlier, and I'll, I'll read this to you. It says, God's relationship to cause is this. He created a good world in which people were free to choose. And because mankind has chosen sin, we live in a broken world. But let our God... Uh, but our God is not the God of deism who created the world and then let it spin out of control while he went off to do something else. Our God who revealed himself through creation, through his word, and through his son is intimately aware and involved in our lives. God sometimes intervenes, but most of the time he allows and uses broken world events for our good. Uh, so even in our struggles, we're not alone. Uh, God is with us. And when we deal with the effects of living in a sinful world, he wants to use our lives to reveal his glory. So all of that kind of brings me back to Paul. Paul, this amazing man of God, this wrote a big chunk of the New Testament who had a thorn in his side that three times went to God and said, God, can you remove this? Can you take it away? And each time God's response was simply, my grace is sufficient. So who was the source of Paul's thorn? Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. So to keep me from being proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. See, a lot of people think that God gave Paul the thorn to keep him humble, but that isn't the case. That's not what the Word says. It says that God allowed it, but Satan sent the messenger. You see this also in the life of, of Peter in Luke chapter 22 where Jesus was talking to Peter and he turns around and he tells him and he says, Listen, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You see the same thing in the life of Job. Uh, Job was a righteous man. And, and God allowed it, but it was Satan that moved on him. And God didn't do it, but he allowed it. And God permitted the suffering in the life of Peter and Job and Paul to a point, but he remained intimately aware of what was going on, but he didn't intervene. Um, our text says this, a messenger to torment me. And that phrase literally means to punch or to strike. Uh, it, it's a very strong uh, term. This is not a comfortable thing. This is something that is legit, real struggle in your life and causes you pain. And, and isn't that the goal of the enemy? To harass you? Uh, to keep trying to make you weak and chip away and chip away and trip you up and knock you down? To torment you? To paralyze you with fear? He wants you to feel hopeless. He wants you to feel like nothing's going to change, that this is going to be forever and ever. And that's what thorns try to do in your life. And whatever form it takes, that's its purpose. Thorns are real uh, and thorns are lasting. There's duration you have to hit them with. 
And Paul says it was a thorn in my flesh, but that doesn't mean that it always is a physical thing. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, it, it was just a physical dynamic. There are emotional things. There are spiritual things. You know, maybe the thorn in your flesh tonight is, is just persistent doubts. You just, you, you just wrestle with doubt. Does God really, really love me? I have days I really feel like God loves me, and then there are days that I think, God, God doesn't love me at all. You know, they have doubts that, that, that pick at your brain. They have doubts that pick on your faith, that pick on your marriage, that pick on your kids. I'm, I'm a terrible mom. I'm a terrible dad. I've just messed this up so bad. And, and we have these things that weigh on us, uh, and, and they're very emotional things. Maybe it's an emotion. Maybe you deal with grief or fear. Maybe anxiety grips you. Well, this could be a thorn in, in your flesh that God has allowed, but the enemy has sent to try to limit you, and it just doesn't seem to let go. And you pray, and you hope, and you work, and you, you stretch, and you grow, and you're becoming, and you're growing in God, but this thing just holds on, and it continues to battle you. Maybe that's your thorn in your flesh. Another thing, maybe it's your will. Um, you know, I've said before, it takes different kind of heat to melt different kind of metals. Uh, and maybe in your will, you're a very stubborn person. Maybe you, uh, maybe it takes a lot of heat to make you pliable. When God wants to bring change, it doesn't come easy. You, you find the hardest way possible to get it done, and you're stubborn. And, and maybe there's just a consistent point of failure uh, in your life. You can be so good at these things, but this thing just seems like it's a sin that has your number. And you wrestle with it, and you wrestle with it, and the devil makes you feel so discouraged sometimes. Uh, maybe that's what's going on. But here's the thing you got to hope and trust. And I'm going to be wrapping up with this is this. If God wasn't going to use your thorn for good in your life, he never would have allowed it. And so next week, we're going to get into that. Next week, we're going to get into how do we allow our thorn to be used for good um, and how God uses it in our lives. So I just want to close by saying this. Listen, if you're facing a trial uh, today, know that it has an ending. Uh, there's a point of breakthrough. Uh, if we do not grow weary and well-doing, if we do not stop, don't quit, hold on. And if you're dealing with a thorn in the flesh, if you're dealing with something, you just say, Pastor, I'm so tired of fighting this thing. I'm so tired of fighting that emotion. I'm so tired of dealing with this part of my life, and I just cannot seem to get, listen, His grace, His grace, His grace. If you fall down seven times, get up eight. Uh, do not give up. Do not lose your way. Stay steady. Stay steady and keep moving forward. God is with you in this. A couple of things before I go. One is stay connected. Stay connected to the church. Sunday mornings, 1030. Our services, Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock. Uh, hey, send this to someone that may need to hear this message. I want to encourage you to share it out. Let's get the word out there. This has been an amazing time of reaching people that we've not normally been able to reach. And it's because folks like you watch it and go, this was good. And you send it to your friends and God moves in these things. Um, Sunday school classes on Sunday morning, 915 to, uh, I'm sorry, 9 to 1015 online through Zoom. Uh, you can get the information on our All Church email. We have an in-person class. Uh, now that we're offering um, on strongholds in the hands of a strong God, a stronger God, and uh, both have just been fantastic. I want to encourage you to come and check those out. Nine to ten, fifteen. Uh, stay faithful in your giving, guys. We love you. There are a lot of things in the building we're having to address right now, and and uh, and we're figuring those things out. But your faithfulness is so critical, and so key, and I thank you. I thank you for being so faithful and loving. And I'm gonna encourage you to just continue to connect with each other. Call folks, call your friends, call your family, call your coworkers, some folks in the church, some folks out of the church, and ask them this question, how can I pray for you and pray for them? Uh, let's be God's hands in this season. First Assembly, I love you. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday and I hope you're able to join us online or in person. God is moving. And I look forward to what God will do in our lives. And make sure you tell somebody about Jesus.